excited. Uh, welcome to Taproom Tastings, uh, hosted by Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center. My name is Catherine Prescott. I'm the chief curator uh, here at Keeler Tavern Museum. Uh, and as always, I'm here with my lovely co-host, Mary Taltis Ottomanelli, uh, historian and scholar and general partner in crime. <laughs> Um, and tonight we are joined by Henry Ward, a professional archeologist, chef and food historian who specializes in creating foods from different cultures and time periods. Um, so his in-depth research and culinary experimentation allow him to develop authentic recipes and menus that span the ages. Uh, the author of Native Chesapeake Cuisine, Recipes Inspired by the Native American Cultures of the Chesapeake Bay Region, Henry travels to historic and cultural events throughout the Middle Atlantic, offering samples of historically inspired food and drink to give visitors a chance to experience unique flavors from the region's past. And Henry kindly uh, provided us with two recipes, which um, I sent out to everyone who registered. Um, so I hope if you have tried out the recipes, uh, let us know. And if you haven't yet, um, they, I will include them in the uh, follow-up email as well again, so everybody can have them and try them. Um, so before we get started in talking about indigenous foodways, I would like to begin by reading uh, the land acknowledgement statement um, that we here at the museum have. Um, so to truthfully acknowledge our site's history and present experiences, it is important to recognize the beginnings of this place. So we take this moment to acknowledge that the history of our site does not start with Europeans. Uh, the town of Ridgefield exists on the ancestral homelands of the Ramapo, Muncie Lenape, and Wishkwaiskek people. They were the original stewards of this land on which the Keeler Tavern Museum and History Center stands today. We thank them for their strength and resilience in stewarding this land, and we hope to continue their legacy of protecting this site and its history. So tonight, we are going to be talking about indigenous <clears throat> foodways, um, the food uh, and everything that kind of goes along with that uh, of the indigenous people in New England and the Middle Atlantic, and, and we'll likely talk about much more throughout the Americas as well, um, because as we'll find out, it is all very, very connected. Um, so I think to start, we'll, um, we'll maybe talk about what were indigenous Americans eating prior to European colonization, um, kind of what were the major ingredients and uh, ways of cooking and things like that. Um, getting my list <laughs> it was a lot I mean I found a lot I'm sure Henry can back up as an archaeologist of all the things that he's been able to find in his career but it was a very I mean I like the diet it's a lot of things that we eat today um they have the three sisters which was squashes and beans and corn and then there was a lot of seasonal food too which always reminds me that I take the grocery store as a luxury of what is in season and what is not in season and what is available to, available to you by region as well. Um, and then I think I got mixed up when I was doing my research because when you start to get early European colonization and traveling and exploration, foods start to move around and nobody's sure where things start to come from. Um, in my case, it was peanuts. I just lost the actual trail of where they came from. I tried to find them. I don't know. I have to go look. That's another lecture we're going to do probably now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Henry, I guess um, if you want to. Uh, yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well. <laughs> um, and just to start off with, I will, I will start with the uh, acknowledgement that I, I am not a, a native person. I am not a tribal member. Unlike um, every other American, I have you know, probably a couple of drops of indigenous blood in me. But I think because I'm an archaeologist, I always joke with people that archaeologists do the dishes. Um, you know, we actually we excavate the site. Anything you left behind, any waste from the, the food processing, the vessels you cooked it in, the hearth you cooked it in, the seasoning, how you serve. I mean, all of that material is left behind. 
And we're getting increasingly sophisticated to the point where we're not just like counting bones and oyster shells. We're actually able to extract the residue from pot shards and identify what was actually being cooked within the pot. We're able to go into the soil and extract the pollen of the plants that were growing in the area. So what was actually in the garden, not just what ended up on the table. And so that does give us a, a range. I, I always sort of joke that when I get an archaeological report, the faunal and floral, the, you know, the plant remains and the animal remains are always in the back. And so I always skip to the back because it, for me, it's basically, it's an ingredients list. You know, these were the foods we know that they were eating. And so that began that sort of process with me on these sites of not only what were we finding, but we, you know, we know probably how they were being prepared. We know what kind of, you know, they did, they had, you know, pots or they didn't have pots. They had used an open fire. They were in a place where you could dry and smoke things. And so again, began to sort of figure out, oops, little, little dog, puppies in the background. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, again, I think it, it very, varied much with um, region and then also with time. Um, I, I always apologize to people that when you talk to archaeologists, you're going to hear about climate change, whether you want to or not, because it's basically all we study <laughs> is the effect of the change of the environment on people. And so probably early on in this continent, the people, you know, were probably fairly focused on big game and literally, you know, hunting elephants and ground sloths and those sorts of things. And so probably a very protein rich diet. And as they moved around and began to exploit different kinds of things, wide range of different kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and amphibians and, you know, anything that crawled or walked or swam. But then also, we then you talked about the grocery store. In some ways, with Native people working, walking out into a Native environment, it is kind of like a grocery store. Early anthropologists estimated that the, the tribes in the northern lakes news of uh, a culinary medicinal or like material use for about 25 percent of the plants they came upon so one out of five plants okay you smoke that to you know clear chest congestion that you can make a basket out of you can make a dye out of that and so again just that wide range of different things that they could choose from uh, and you're right again in as you get into in in the americas it's hard to emphasize how important uh, corn and squash and beans were. It was really the foundation for most of the, unless you like some people like out in California, we had to live on acorns because you were in a desert, <laughs> but most everybody else, by the time those um, products arrived, you know, sometimes thousands of years ago, they became the foundation um, for the cuisine and they remain today. They remain very important and indigenous and, you know, and of foods from the Americas, from Central America and South America. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that surprised me was I didn't realize corn was not native to North America. Yeah. Um, but I did find that, you know, that was corn and most of the beans um, that we know of now all came out of the Central um, yeah. and South America. And but they were so useful in, in many different ways that they ended up nearly all indigenous people in the Americas have some sort of kind of corn, beans, squash triad. Um, and there's and, a lot of the movement. I mean, again, as you say, we know that that package basically came out of Mesoamerica, around the Caribbean, up the Mississippi, and then spread out through the US. Um, at the same time, the bow and arrow, we got that from the northern tribe, you know, the northern tribes. But again, we didn't have the bow and arrow until a couple of hundred AD. Everything else before there was a spear. And again, it was that movement of the idea and the tool into the area. And that's a lot again, a lot of you things were invented in place, but as you say, there's a lot of movement and also trade and exchange that went on between regions. Um yeah, and I, I think also as I was doing research, as you said, every, things changed dramatically throughout, you know, the thousands and thousands of years, the millennia um, prior to colonization. You know, the people 
the indigenous people who were living in um, the the very early you know colon or settlement of the Americas are eating something completely different from the Wishkwaiskek and the Ramapo who are here in Ridgefield as European colonists are coming, um, and the the where kind of those megafauna that you talked about from the early period are extinct by then. And so um, I think part of it is just the, the span of time that is pre-colonial um, sometimes gets shrunken down um, much smaller than and generalized in a way that it really can't be. Yeah, and there's a lot, I mean, frankly, archeology, span I always tell people, you know, it's like archaeology is you have a jigsaw puzzle and you like put it out outside the window where the car is moving and just scatter all the pieces <laughs> everywhere. And that we there's a lot of stuff we don't know. Um, and in fact, it's actually kind of exciting because in the last 10 years, I mean, we're rewriting the history of the population of this continent. You know, we're now pushing it back thousands of years. Things that were fringe theories when I was a student are now established fact. And, you know, and, and again, that's it's interesting because archaeology gives us sort of a unique chance to test theories. And so, you know, again, everybody talks about the three sisters and how important it was. And everybody was sitting in a palisaded village growing these crops. And, and you know, I ex we, ex we excavated for the state of Delaware so extensively from the highway projects. It's a small state that we covered like a big chunk of it. And it's like, okay, where is all the corn? Where is the squash? Where are the beans? And again, it, it, there was not, it didn't appear to be whole scale adaptation of them. You know, the people, they were living in an incredibly rich estuarine environment. They were probably eating a lot of seafood and a lot of like, you know, crabs and oysters and other kinds of things. They had all of these seed grasses, the chemopodium and goosefoot and sunflower seeds and things that they've been eating all along, amaranth. And so when corn and squash and beans came along, it was like, eh, yeah, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I saw we have a question come in. Um, Caroline asks, what did they eat before the three sisters arrived from Mesoamerica? I think herd sedge grass. Yep. I guess, uh, what's that? And what else beyond fish and hunted animals? So I guess it kind of goes into what you were saying of what was available to them and what was regionally available to them. And, and I mean, nuts, um, again, very important. In fact, one of the, the ch climatic changes that took place was a shift from, you know, basically a carnivorous pine forest into one that was oak and hickory based. And all of a sudden, again, all of that, what we call mast, the tree uh, seeds would have become very, very important. A lot of, again, um, what they call a pseudo grains. So like an amaranth, which is, it's basically a grain, but it's a seed of a plant. Those are very rich in protein, very rich in, in oils. Um, mm -hmm. You know, again, at the um, very often, one of the things again, is that it's very specific also to the, the area. And again, in this area that I work in, where we have the Delaware and the Chesapeake, people really did exploit the, seafood of fish and crabs and, and oysters to the point where it was almost industrial production and it formed the basis of you know a, an economy um, and I think it's one of the things that's really interesting is that in most of North America we have very little evidence of the domestication of a mammal for food almost everybody else on the planet had a, a goat a pig a cow a llama uh, something but we didn't don't really seem to have that. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with the fact that the three sisters, not only do they grow in a lot of a wide range of climatic conditions, they're very easy to dry and store. But interestingly, from a nutritional standpoint, none of them is particularly nutritionally rich. But if you eat all three, you have them in your diet, they have complementary amino acids that basically form a, a meat or a dairy quality protein. So you're getting your protein from the ground, from those plants. So you can hunt and fish if you want to, but you don't have to. And so again, that I think is why do I want to have a herd of deer 
if you want a deer, give me 20 minutes, I'll get a deer and bring it back. But I don't, why do I have to like protect them from the wolves and feed them? And how, how can we move around with them? How do you herd deer? And yeah, I think maybe we're not gonna worry about that. Now the turkey, we do have some evidence from the Southwest genetically that there seems to be something weird. It doesn't look like a totally wild population that we're finding archeologically. And so it could be that they had penned turkeys. That's a very different thing than trying to herd a deer. Hopefully I mean, I'm turkeys are pretty mean. Hmm? I was going to say, turkeys are pretty mean. Yeah, but again, they're small. <laughs> and they can't kill you. <laughs> it's a different conversation they can try. for a different day. <laughs> yeah, it takes more than one. Let's put it that way. Yeah. So when you're looking and you're on site and you're doing excavation work, are there things that you particularly look for when you're trying to figure out at the space who is eating what? How can I tell? What do all of these little things put together mean? And being able to place like a group of people or an individual household's diet put together, I mean, in that kind of a sense. Yeah, I mean, ideally, that's what you want is you want a nice discrete site that, that has, you know, air, what we call activity areas. Here is mm -hmm. a house, here's a hearth, here's a trash bin. You love that because again, that's sort of a place in time. But very often what we're looking, we always say that archaeology is like a layer cake. And, yeah. You know, the first cake has to go down first. So that's the oldest and then the next and then the next. And so, again, you know, sometimes you can look at the patterning within a site, but also then the patterning through time and see, again, obviously the big change in the way that people cooked when pottery arrived. Again, pottery in this area is relatively late. It's at about that ADBCs. Um, crossover. Prior to that, except for stone bowls, there were no permanent cooking vessels. So that's a big difference in how you can actually, what you can cook and how you can cook. Um, we also, again, a lot of the things, you see bones, you see shells, those are relatively stable and usually are well preserved in most soil conditions. But we also, we screen all the soil to get even the little small pieces. And then mm -hmm. we go to a whole nother level where you actually turn soil samples into a slurry and run them through a window screen. And then all of a sudden you're getting fish scales and tiny little bird bones and burnt you know, uh, seeds. And so it becomes to be a pretty rich and then you add the pollen in and you really do have a pretty good idea of what foods were available. Um, and it, with the, each of those foods, we know, you know what they would have tasted like, what kind of nutritional and you know, most of them still exist. And so you can, you know, reconstruct, you know, a lot of that. Um, but again, those kinds of sites where you find that depth of information are getting rarer and rarer. Um, archaeology, even though we're making history, archaeological sites are a finite resource. And it's been estimated that probably 65, 70% of the archaeological sites in America are gone. They're either underwater, they have been paved over, they've been excavated. And so again, we're beginning to work with a smaller and smaller environment. And so it's good. I mean, one of the things, it's interesting that with archaeology, when we find something, we only excavate half of it, if we can, if a site can be preserved. Because the idea mm -hmm. is that somebody in 20 years is going to be able to come back and do a much better job because they're going to have tools and technology that we can only dream of. And so again, we try to preserve so that we can go back and look to find out more. There's a lot of sites that were excavated. I mean, you go back 20, 30 years, they're just not getting the same level of information. They're not looking in the soils. They're not finding the pollen. And so that's all you know, information that was lost. So very meticulous. The fine, yeah, people like the, it's like, the... you know, slow motion gardening, it's been called. <laughs> no, it's, I, I, I like hearing different approaches to history as me and Catherine are book bound. I mean, oh, yeah. archives, public history. Research and I love that, that stuff so. too. I mean, I, I love, I mean, you know, I, I also collect cookbooks and I'm fascinated by historical cuisine. But I mean, I think it's it's interesting and a little bit more challenging as you go further and further back. I mean, your recipes begin to kick in about Roman. There's not much before that. And so a lot of that, again, there's the only way to figure it out is to look at the ingredients, look at the technology. And, I, you know, I got into this, I was giving a lecture about archaeology and food and somebody got up and said you don't know what that tasted like and it was like corn salt 
yeah, I know what that tastes like. And it tasted the same a thousand years ago. Now, it may not have been prepared exactly the same way, but I can make corn that would taste like it would have tasted. And so that idea, again, of what can we go ahead, not only to write about a site, but how do we turn that into a recipe? How do we actually cook that with the realization that it may not be exactly the same as anybody had cooked it, but it is authentic flavors, authentic technique, and probably a flavor that would have been familiar to the people back then. They would taste it and go, oh yeah, cornbread. Not like my mother's, but it's okay. <laughs> Um, so you mentioned, you know, through the archaeology, we can see that some of the tools, the remains of the tools that are left behind and, and some of the techniques that they were using to cook. Um, so what were, you mentioned like ceramics didn't, weren't really used until, um, you know, near the BCAD divide. So what were indigenous people using and how were they cooking? all of these ingredients that they have access to. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it, I mean, direct roasting. I mean, a sharp stick and a piece of meat, that's probably one of the oldest recipes we have, and people would have continued to do that. Um, you could, you know, there's a, a lot of, you know, you would have earth ovens where you could, again, dig a hole, line it with rock, put in food, cover that with leaves, put another layer of food, and, you know, that kind of a thing was certainly, that goes back you know, to the beginning of time. Um, you can use like basketry. Basketry can actually be sealed to the point where you can basically heat a hot rock and put it inside a basket and raise the temperature of that water. It, you keep it below a certain level. It, it basically does, it's not gonna, you know, cook the, the basket. You can do that with bark. You can dig a hole in the ground and put a, a deer hide in it and use hot rocks to go ahead and rice something. And again, if you keep on adding rocks, you can bring it to a boil. You can cook it for as long as you want. In this area, the first permanent cooking vessels were actually carved out of a, a special kind of stone called steatite or soapstone. And you guys have it up there. It basically, it outcrops along the front of the Appalachian Mountains from about Maine down to Georgia. And oh. so it was very heavily exploited both for cooking vessels, for pipes, and also for ornamental uh, goods. And actually, I have an interesting theory about the steatite because um, it's remarkable material. It's, it's the softest naturally occurring mineral on the planet. You can actually carve, it's about as hard as your fingernail. So you can actually carve it with your fingernail. So you can carve it with any kind of stone or bone tool you want. Oh they make lab sinks out of it because it's completely physically inert. In Scandinavia, they still make skittles, I mean, uh, skillets um, to cook uh, pancakes on because it has a really good heat like distribution. And so I think that it must have been a really interesting cooking medium. And, and I would argue that sort of tongue in cheek, I'm not sure how you could deep fry anything if it was not in a steatite vessel. You can't cook it in a hive because it's going to burn. You can't put it in mm -hmm. a low fire pot. It's going to explode. You can't put it in a basket. You can't. So, you know, they were frying food 3,000 years ago and then stopped. <laughs> and then basically didn't start back up again until they got cast iron. <laughs> oh. Yeah. That was really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I happened, it, they, there was a series of outcroppings along the Maryland Pennsylvania line. And so when I was a grad student, I did a whole series of surveys and got to see thousands of these cooking vessels. And that was one of those things where, again, it's that cook in me going, all right, I, yes, you could cook soup in that, but that's a wok. That's what that shape is. Why would yeah. you, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't make it that way if you were boiling something. And so I, I think that it's interesting. It's one of those technologies that was probably lost through time. Because as soon as you figured out you could make a pot from the clay in that creek over there, you didn't really need to walk to Pennsylvania to get one. Yeah. Much, much easier. Um, so you did mention frying. So yeah, Jennifer yeah. asked, what, what fat would they be using? Um, animal fats is probably, again, is a, a good start because, again, a large deer or a bear or some large mammal is going to have a fairly good amount of, of fat in it. You also can extract oils from nuts. 
And so certainly walnut oil, um, uh, actually I've been told that hickory, hickory nuts are so hard to clean that the, 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 what you did is you actually put them in a mortar, you pounded them into a paste, you poured water on it, and then basically mm. scooped up the oil and the cream off of it. Um, sunflowers, again, were indigenous. So sunflower oil, you could certainly press them. Um, also, again, I would think, especially in this area, because we have estuaries, uh, so you have a body of water that is fresh water at one end and salt water at the other. And you have animals, as we all know, like salmon, who have to return back to the, the stream that they were born in to spawn at one time of the year in the spring for a couple of weeks. There were more fish coming up the Susquehanna and the Delaware and the James and the Potomac than you could possibly ever eat. And a lot of them are fairly oily fish, like the shad. So I am not sure that they would not have gotten fish oil. Um, out in the northwest coast of this country, there is a fish called the olachen or the candlefish that is so oily that the Native Americans there actually did press oil out of it and made special little wooden boxes. And it was a trade item. The olachen oil was considered to be a, like a, a very, a, um, it uses as a seasoning. You dribble it on food. And so it was so valuable, it was actually traded. There's, there's a oh. culture on the Southwest <laughs> coast of Chile that was based on the anchovy. Because again, they would just happen to have anchovies welling up from these cold water. You could catch more anchovies than you could possibly eat. So they basically turned it into anchovy paste and stored it. They found rooms of this stuff where they would just like be storing this stuff and like you would a grain almost. And so it's the kind of thing you can exploit some na native animal products to the point, like with a buffalo, where you could live off of, off of almost it alone. I learned about four new things just now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad, I thank you. I, I <laughs> no, again, I, I, it's weird. I, I think that it, it when that person got up and, and heckled me at that meeting, it was very interesting because it was sort of like all the different aspects of my training, the archaeologist, the anthropologist, the chef, the historian, then, you know, I had to take a nutrition class and learn about nutrition. It was like mm -hmm. all these people got around the table for the first time and said, yeah, the three sisters, but what about the deer? They didn't domesticate the deer. It's like, yeah, but, and so all of this stuff sort of came together. So. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad that you guys are interested in this sort of stuff and I get invites like this because I find it fascinating. I mean, food is so central. It is almost the most important thing in a culture. And so being able to look at it as the lens to look at that culture is always fascinating. Yeah. I see Chelsea just sent in a question um, about your research and then kind of how you conduct it. Do you consult Native peoples? How do you go about, I mean, because you mentioned all of your different backgrounds. So when you're putting together a program, what are you pulling from? Where are you asking people for help? How are you putting them together? That's that's a great question. Um, I do have, um, it's interesting that you mentioned Lenape because we have them down in Delaware uh, where mm -hmm. I went to grad school. And so I, through my contacts there, I have got to know um, the, the Lenape in Delaware very well and the chief. And so I've done a number of programs with them and talk with them about it. Um, it's a little interesting that, you know, you had sent out one of the questions to, that we were going to talk about, about recreation versus reconstruction versus revitalization versus, and in some ways, although I can talk, I too talk with, with tribal folks, and I, again, there's a person with me today who is um, Mat Matapanai, um, that, Many of sort of the food memories, the food history, what people remember eating is food from the reservation period or after, because there was such a clean break from mm -hmm. the old ways to the new ways that it, sometimes it's hard when I talk about, you know, my cornbread, nobody's ever had that kind of cornbread. I mean, I use a Western recipe because it's the one that's the most authentic. And mm -hmm. when I, you know, people go ahead, I'm helping now, we have a, 
um, a project we're doing in, in Maryland where we're re redoing a, a somewhat famous uh, cookbook from the 1960s. But instead of just having rich white people's food in it, we're going to actually talk to everybody about all of their foods. And so I have been reaching out to the local tribes, both the, the Natacoke and the Piscataway, the local folks, as well as the Lumbee and the Lenape. And very often what they're eating is very hard to distinguish from what their neighbors are eating. The traditional Lumbee dish is called chicken and pastry. It's chicken and flat dumplings. Pretty much just that. Um, and again, it very often there's that mixture of the, the you know, Afro-American soul food and the Native American, and it sort of gets layered. Um, and then again, the reservation, um, you know, we, I, one of the things when I go and do pre presentations at powwows, I kind of set myself up because I don't, I don't make fry bread, which, <laughs> um, but A again, big touchstone. Yeah, yeah, it is, but it's it it is also very complicated because there's nothing yeah. indigenous in it. Yeah, and it was food of oppression that the Navajo women on the reservations out there were given, which I had never heard it called this way until recently. Up in Canada, they call it the five white gifts: hmm. flour, yeah. sugar, salt, lard, and milk. And again, they had no idea what these things were. It had nothing, no precedent in their food diet. But they figured right. out, okay, I gotta fry something. I'm gonna make it out of flour, and that's how fry bread, you know, became a thing. But again, it's it doesn't have any indigenous ingredients, and it touches on another very difficult product, which is, I mean, I have a rule of thumb: never eat a donut bigger than your head. And that's what a fry bread is. It's a donut the size of your head that can't be good for you. And especially not in a population that has such challenges with the rest of the nutrition and such high rates of diabetes and obesity. And that the fact that the foods that we forced them to eat in the, in the reservation became nostalgic foods, which they continue to eat and continue to eat commodity cheese, even though they're lactose intolerant. And again, it's just they're continuing to that I think it's one of the most um, amongst the list of horrible things that happened to native peoples in the assimilation was taking them out of that native food way where they were hunting and gathering and basically a healthy, well-rounded, nutritious diet and taught them to eat like junk food and that it is literally killing them to this day. We spoke about when we were kind of discussing what we wanted to talk about of, of bridging the disconnect between that. And I think that goes into the recreation and revitalization and how that all works together. And last year when we did this, we had two very talented, uh, I was going to say authors, but they created a cookbook, which kind of bridged the gap of taking those reservation foods and mixing it with their traditional uh, or I want to say original diets of the indigenous foodways that we were talking about of those things that you can find in nature and not sugar. Um, is there, do you see a change in the last couple of decades of that wanting to reconnect and reconstruct and revitalize the foodways? And what does that look like? How do indigenous chefs today pull from those kind of natural elements and kind of mixing it in with the the memories that they know of tacos and uh like what is it fry bread tacos i've read about yeah yeah Navajo and, tacos yeah yeah and kind of mixing that gap and what does that food way look like how do do you know how they would pull or when you're making a cookbook how do you pull from those major influences yeah yeah i mean it's it's actually interesting um i started this process probably about 30 years ago and at that time, there really, I could not find any cookbooks. I could not find almost any source material. I could find ethnobotanical studies about the foods, but very mm -hmm. little about, you know, native foods or actually the foods that the native people were cooking. And that and luckily has begun to reverse itself. In the last decade or so, there's a whole generation, folks like Sean Sherman out in Minnesota, who, had, who was, again, just won the James Beard Award for the best new restaurant in America. 
is again very focused on not only you know foods from the various tribal areas but focusing on indigenous ingredients and foods that we no longer eat and choke cherries and wild rice and and again so he's really gone ahead and you know re embraced that and taken back that sort of food sovereignty and then there's a whole series of other chefs who are taking a fusion approach, which again, I think is fascinating, where they will go ahead and use an indigenous ingredient, but use it in a different way, or go ahead and, you know, take a, a, um, a native recipe, but use other kinds of uh, ingredients in it. And so I think that stuff is fascinating. And it's interesting that I'm getting to the point where, again, I'm, I'm speaking as an archaeologist. There are now people who are talking, I mean, who, whose actual story is being told. This is not my, I mean, I'm doing it from a scholarly, almost impressionistic approach. So I'm actually getting to the point now where I am beginning to want to, to reach out and spread out and look at, again, other kinds of foods and cuisines and looking at the Quaker, looking at the Pennsylvania Dutch. I mean, my food, I mean, I can talk about my people too. Um, mm -hmm. And let the folks that are beginning to reclaim their culinary tradition be the ones as they should that are telling the stories and and i think that we talked a little bit about you know there are places you know it, it's interesting that we tend to think that much of native culture is sort of as is either hidden or sort of behind the scenes or but if you actually look at some of the regional cuisines in this country i mean in the southwest there is literally a like the cult of the chili that is a native wild ingredient. Now it's been cultivated, but again, that, you know, it, it's, and it's all, it's in that Pueblo kind of setting. You get to the, up into um, the Northwest coast, there's a fetish of the salmon. And again, a native ingredient and native preparation and the, the planking it and smoking it and all of that, you, you know, and so I think that it's, you know, we go to the Northeast. Again, there's the Church of the Maple syrup, which is, again, an indigenous native ingredient that we learn from the natives that really is part of that story. It just, it's kind of the connection has been lost. And so a lot of the people in those areas are reconnecting that food and the people and being able to, again, because that's the main thing that was really nice to hear in the, the land acknowledgement. Native peoples are very proud of their past, very proud of all of that. What they want you to understand is the present that they are still here. Don't talk about us in the past tense, talk to us. And let's talk about the future together. And so again, I think that is was very important as I began to actually talk with folks from the tribes to get that perspective, because mine has always been sort of looking backwards, looking at the old way versus what are we doing today and what are we gonna do in the future? Yeah, I think, um, and. Uh, in our follow-up email, we'll um, include some of these people, um, links to some of their work. But I know that there are more and more of these kind of chef historian um, people who are who are looking into their own heritage, the, the various indigenous um, peoples like Sean Sherman, um, or um, I think Lois Ellen Frank, um, I've heard, but I think one of the things that is um, interesting, a little um, upsetting, I guess, is that most of the people who have seen success, who are becoming names, they are from groups in the Southwest or the Midwest, you know, the places where these reservations, where that disconnect from the native culture is not as great maybe time-wise as opposed to to like here in the northeast yep i think um, you're right yeah absolutely you know a again it's sort of we can sort of think about you know it's like with the rising sea level you know that the europeans it's you know the, the the coasts were so inundated and so many hundreds of years of subjugation under european that they're really i mean you can only hear faint echoes as you get out into the southwest or the north or, or the northwest or the central plains where it is that a greater continuity you're right that's where a lot of those people are coming from because again they they, they still have access to 
stuff that a lot of other people have, have lost. I mean, when I talk with the folks in Malape, you know, again, yes, they eat succotash with lima beans and bacon. And <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I mean, so it sounds there's delicious. A between, but, and there's nothing, actually, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And there, there is food that is, you know, there's your know, tradition is one thing, but a food, a comfort food, and a food of nostalgia and your family's recipes and all those things are just as valid. It just, you know, we're looking at them from, from different perspectives. And again, I, you know, I, I am, you know, sometimes I, I decry the fact that I don't, I mean, I have my own culinary traditions. I have my grandmother's and my great grandmother's recipes, but being able, I mean, that there's a cookbooks have been written about that food on that, you know, the fact that it has taken this long for, and, and Sean talk, you know, Sean Sherman talks about that. And again, his, you know, his book and his, I mean, I've, I've never been to his restaurant, but I've eaten his food because he, he catered a conference I went to, is that he was going through culinary school and they, he said they were teaching me to cook every single kind of food on the planet, except my family, my people's food. There was nothing about that. And he just said, okay, I, that's not going to stand. I'm, I'm going to go refocus myself and learn about that. And again, he's made, you know, start off with a food truck and now he has a James Beard winning restaurant. And a great cookbook, by the way, The Sous Chef, if you haven't gotten it, it's really, really good. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that I kind of fell, one of the rabbit holes I fell into in researching in, because I think there had been such a violent disconnect here in the Northeast, that when um, in the, the end of the 19th century, when there's a, this kind of colonial revivalism uh, going on in New England, especially, um, that these white middle class wealthy women who are trying to create a traditional New England cuisine, they kind of use these native um, indigenous food and kind of layered stories on them to try and justify them being, you know, traditional New England, right? Like all the things we think of for Thanksgiving, right? Baked beans and cranberry sauce and all of that, while they might have kind of origins in things that the Wampanoag and the Tuxet and the um, Lenape, you know, here in New England would have cooked the modern dishes are really Western dishes. Yeah. That, and actually it's interesting because that's when we started looking at, I think we were the 250th anniversary of the Harmon, Hammond House and they, they published what was called the Maryland Way Cookbook. And so when we began to look at that, it was like, okay, this is really interesting. So this is, you know, food being submitted by rich white women with a big house for food that they did not cook, that their black cooks cooked, that was Native American food. It was crabs and corn and and you know clams and shad and um, shad roe and terrapin stew and all of these things literally that were coming. And you know, and, and in some ways, you know, the the fact that Europeans survived at all at some level was either they adopted or were taught how to 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 eat the food of the land i mean most of the europeans got here were city dwellers they didn't know a terrapin from a hole in the ground and so it would have had, had to have been someone that said okay this is how you cook a turtle <laughs> to go ahead and the fact that you know it's interesting that i you know i at one point i gave a, the, this lecture the first one that i gave was this the the evolution of the chesapeake culinary tradition that it starts literally with the formation of the estuary at the end of the ice age and all of those foods that were available and what the native americans learned to, to eat and then what the co colonists finally adopted so that they could survive and then you get the, the colonial influence and the european materials and european but again in baltimore today if you don't have an ethnic restaurant you better have a crab cake. you better have a roasted chicken there better be corn on the menu I mean, again, these are tastes that go back literally to the last ice age and it becomes, and I think it's really interesting that it's like the shad, um, 
it, it's pretty ubiquitous. I mean, you only can get them for like about three weeks in the in the springtime. But when you can get them, you know, anybody can get them because they're incredibly cheap because there are so many of them. So everybody planks shad. But I think it's that interesting, as you said, you know, that that it's almost like culinary sort of mythology that, you know, this idea of the baked beans. Um, you know, clearly, yes, the beans indigenous and, you know, the molasses is early and, you know, mustard seeds were available. And so it, it all it all kind of makes sense. But it, it is interesting that I think the regionalism and that connection to the past and again, the rewriting of the history that this, you know, coming up with a story to make it part of your history. Um, and again, that, you know, it, because when we talk when we talk about plank shad, we're not talking about the Susquehannock Indians planking shad. We're talking about you know my grandmother doing it, and so again that connection to the past and to the native peoples is broken. Um, I did see uh, Chelsea uh, asked a really interesting question. Um, she says, I know that native people shape the land in their cultivation of different foods. Um, I guess I think more of examples with South American native populations, but uh, do we know to what extent did North American people shape their land? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, as we talked, we go through thousands and thousands of years of basically head hunting and gathering which was laying pretty lightly on the land. Um, it wasn't probably until you get, a, again, about that AD, BC swift over that we begin to get the Three Sisters and sort of intensive horticulture. And it is probably easy to assume and to look at anthropological um, evidence for what's called Swidden or slash and burn agriculture, is that, again, you can't grow crops in the middle of a forest. It doesn't really work that way. And so you basically, you gird the trees to kill them. You then fell them and burn them off and you burn off the brush. And so there would have been clearing of land near where the settlements were to allow for horticulture. Um, one of the other interesting things is it's, it's strange <laughs> what, you know, the unanticipated consequences of drought. One of the things with the river levels being so low so many places is we're beginning to see um, fish weirs actually beginning to be seen on the surface and are finding out how much, how uh, common they were, that any place that there were fish runs, people were actually going ahead and building essentially sort of stone funnels where the fish would enter the wide part of this funnel, be funneled down to an area where there would be a net or somebody with a spear. And so again, we're seeing these fish weirs again as that, you know, sort of modifying the, the environment to help you exploit the resources. Um, you know, again, in other parts of this country, you know, life itself would have been impossible without irrigation. I mean, in the Southwest, you know, the Anastasi and their other groups, they were, you know, water engineers, how to take the little bit of water that the environment gave them and how to channel it to the growing field so they could grow the crops that they needed. So, and again, I think there has been nothing like, you know, when we got into the steel plow and industrial where we could plow up an entire middle of the continent and plant corn. I mean, nothing quite like that, but there would have been this mosaic of areas that had been cleared. And they probably also understood that if you continue to grow the same crops in the same location for too long, all of a sudden the corn starts to shrink. So you need to move to another area and then come back to that one in a couple of years. That all would have been you know, something that they understood. I feel like such a city kid when we talk about some of this stuff. Hmm? I said, I feel like such a city kid when we talk about some of the stuff <laughs> that we cover on this program, because I'm always just like, what do you mean? I grew up with so much concrete around me. And then I'm reminded that my grandparents came from the mountains of Greece and did this. And I should know how to do this too. And then I'm like, Look at my little herb garden that I got from Trader Joe's. Does this count? <laughs> so every time I, we talk about these kind of topics and we talk about how intricate farming is and development and cultivation and all of these things, I'm always just like amazed by just the simple technologies that, I mean, that, like how you were saying, the steel plow and industrialization, how much 
people accomplished before technology and how much it rapidly increased with all of that technology. So, And again, one could argue that that pendulum has swung a, a bit far. Mm -hmm. And that in, you know, again, the food is, is cheaper and easier and cleaner than it probably has ever been. However, the industrialization of horticulture and of animal husbandry, the fact that we're relying, I mean, I saw some horrifying statistic is like we're getting 60% or something of our food from like five plants, not different mm -hmm. kinds of plants, five freaking subspecies of a, that kind of corn, that potato and that rice, not the hundreds of the different varieties that once existed. But literally down to that monoculture yeah. and then all of a sudden we find out hey wait a minute we get an inch less rain this year that corn doesn't grow that potato is not going to yield and we've sort of backed ourselves into these genetic corners with the way that we've manipulated the plants and animals and people are beginning to realize and there so there is that diversification and you know like organics and also the you know the heirlooms i mean that no one talked about heirlooms i mean an heirloom was something you stopped eating that your grandmother used to eat now we're going back and trying to find those seeds <laughs> because they tasted better and they lasted longer and they were no more nutritious they, they just didn't happen to can up as well all right, so we have just a few more minutes until 7.30. Um, so I just wanna, if anyone has any questions um, they wanna ask us or, or Henry, um, they can just uh, just type them into the chat and we'll try and address as many as we can. Also, do, do feel free when you post the stuff, if you would like to put my contact information, if anybody would like to contact me with any follow-up questions or let me know if you try the recipes and, uh, or you know, if they came out or want a copy of the cookbook, please do reach out. All right, we'll definitely include that information. Um, Kelsey has got another great question. Uh, how much of a role did food play in the community and the celebrations of native peoples? Do we know that, you know, I know food is a big thing in, in current present day indigenous um, community and, and gatherings and things like that. Do we know? about that in in the past Is it's it possible hard to, to tell? it's it's hard to know however i think that it, it's always difficult i mean it's easy to find an oyster shell it's a little harder to go, to go ahead and sort of tease out you know what people were thinking however if you do look at the kinds of decorations you see on pottery we do look at we know that people made deer headdresses we do know that you know, again, they were celebrating plants and animals in their art. And so clearly, again, you know, they were, it was very, very important. And also the, the idea, you know, we have gotten past the point of like, even with our great grandfathers and, and before, the fact that, you know, we were a, a, one bad harvest away from not having enough food for the kids. And so there is, I know, um, that there's a lot of ritual, especially out in the Southwest, about rain and about water. And all those Kachina dolls are basically be begging for rain because if you don't get a certain amount of rain, you're not gonna get enough corn. And again, somebody's gonna end up being hungry. And so I think that, and I think, you know, from what we know of, of Native peoples and um, the spiritual beliefs, again, the fact that they they definitely would have had totems you know we know that a lot of the the artwork we see is a little animals it is a bear or it's a deer or it's a beaver or something and so again these would not only have been a, a source of food they were a part of the mythology they were part of the legends they were probably considered to be spirits of you know just like you know the, it, many native people see every living being as having a spirit whether it's an animal or a plant or a human being and so I imagine as you go back in time, that was even more important. And again, you were, you know, you, you, they talk about, you know, doing a prayer before a hunt and then, you know, doing a Thanksgiving over the animal. You know, thank you, brother, for the food that you were giving to me and my family. And that connection, I think, again, would have been something, again, that we've really lost. And that people are going ahead and trying to reconnect back into and like, you know, thinking about where that food comes from. Um, and and not just and not as a commodity, but as an important part of that circle of life. Again, the city kid in me is like, oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. 
No, I, I, I mean, I can definitely see the influence of Barb and Table. And, and for me, it comes in with restaurants that are tailored to that of we buy from the same farms that are local and they are organic and all of these fun, fancy new words that I'm learning about and what is real and what is marketing and what is actually truly considered local and where they were coming from and heirlooms. And that's a word that I've started to see a little bit more in the grocery stores, which is, I had to Google that one. I was like, okay, but what does that mean? You've put it in big, bold letters, but yeah, well, there I have two hands up. You can't see them, but, <laughs> but the concept of all of those words and how important they are and where your food comes from, right? Like these are the indigenous tribes that were on this land came first. They were using these foods first. They were growing them and cultivating them first. And this is why we should talk about that. No, absolutely. And, and again, it, it is tough. Um, one of the real challenges in the food world is bad food is cheap. I mean, McDonald's, I mean, again, it's ridiculous that you can go in and like buy a hamburger for a dollar. I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. That's, that's a loss leader. But, you know, going ahead and you want to buy organic, that's, you know, you're paying surcharge. You want to, the heirloom is going to be a surcharge. And so, mm-hmm. again, it's unfortunate that we're making sort of the healthier and more interesting and more traditional foods sort of harder and harder for people to get and more and more expensive. And, and again, that's a real challenge if you're trying to feed a family, you know, are you, you're really going to go ahead and like be able to invest in heirlooms. Is that where your priority is going to be? But however, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as organic. There's three aisles of it now. There was food from, you know, when I grew up, I, I, you know, the fact that you can walk into a grocery store and find food from around the world and that I, you know, I can buy, you know, things that I don't even know what they taste like because there's new stuff coming in. I mean, that is also that part of, you know, and, and those are also food cultures is that yeah. those are, you know, traditional foods from a different place and a different time and a different evolution from their indigenous beginnings to where they are today. Yeah. Picking out your food is, is a, interesting thing to do at the supermarket these days. Um, I've spoken before about this, but my grandparents had this very large backyard. And growing up, we didn't pay for things like cucumbers and tomatoes and squashes and pumpkins and figs and all this other stuff. So I think I look back now, I'm in my 30s, I have a child and I look at these things and I go, they they were onto something, but I don't have that space. And in order to get that space, you have to move farther and farther out. And it's a whole other thing and commodity, easy what is worth it on your bill and all this other stuff are definitely big influences that you have to think about. No, but again, I think that educational part of it is, is very important. Um, I did a fundraiser a couple of months ago um, for this group called Taste Wise Kids. And they basically, they have these programs that they take out to the schools of mm-hmm. sitting down and teaching kids where food comes from. Yeah. I mean, I, when I do my, my live demonstrations and I have a pestle and I show them a you know, a, an ear of corn and then a dried corn and then corn kernels and then ground down into the meal and then made into cornbread. I mean, I'm watching the little heads go. That, yeah, that we had no idea. We thought it came from a jar. It came from yeah. a package. And, and and it's just really interesting stuff also that instead of like sort of the trickle down, you know, from the culture through the parents to the kids going to the kids and saying, okay, this is your health. This is, you know, what you do to your body when you're young is going to have a really big influence. So, you know, tell your parents you want to go to the farmer's market and not to McDonald's. And you want to learn about some of the new foods, take you to an interesting restaurant. I mean, that's, and so I think it's a sort of interesting, almost subversive <laughs> to get the kids to be the agents of change. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm- to the new generation. Yeah, for sure. Um, I was actually in preparing for this, I ended up in another rabbit hole on food and memory and food in museums. And um, this one article I was reading just pointed out that the United States is one of the only developed countries in the world that does not have a national public museum dedicated to food and agriculture. Um, Hmm. Like Canada has their own, they have a National Agriculture Museum and Mexico, I think they have a National Agriculture Museum as well. Um, So that's what I'm looking forward to is hopefully soon we'll have an agriculture and food museum, um, maybe part of the Smithsonian uh, 
We'll see. Yeah. We'll have to start advocating for that. Um, Time to write them a letter. Yeah, because <laughs> I do think, I mean, that's what you say is we've been so disconnected from where our food comes from and it's, we are becoming reconnected um, to that. And, and I think that's yeah, really and again, it, it's It's slow, but I remember, again, when I was a kid, I don't really remember a farmer's market. Mm -hmm. There are like 18 farmers markets in the city of Baltimore. Luckily, the one that's right near me is open 12 months out of the year. And so again, oh. just being able to go and talk to the farmers, the guys that actually grow the stuff is again, I mean, I think that's a, a wonderful education. You know, we every time I took my kids out to Chinese food, we went to the Chinese grocery beforehand. We walked around and we looked at all the different like fruits and vegetables. We talked about all the different foods. Because again, it's such a, again, a fascinating window into cultures. And, you know, again, I, I grew up at a, you know, pretty white bread American diet, but, you know, every time I have a new, I, I try a new dish, I, I think it, it tells me something about the world. It tells me something about a different people. It gives give me in touch with, a, you know, different way of being human. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're actually over time. Um, we've been having <laughs> such fun with this conversation. Um, I hope everybody uh, listening in enjoyed it too. Um, thank you for the great questions. Thank you, Henry, for joining us. Um, thank you. And we hope to see everybody back again next month. Uh, it will be February 14th, Valentine's Day. Uh, and we will be talking about bread. Uh, and all the different so types. Good. Uh, so so good. that'll be a great one too. Uh, so thank you all so much and have a great thank night. You.